Welcome to Computer and Network Security. Today we are going to talk about database security. So to start off, I want to just give you an overview of what a database is. Uh, it's just a structured collection of data stored for use by one or more applications. It contains the relationships between the data items and the groups of data items. Um, usually it contains sensitive data. Um, a uh, company is often built on the data that it maintains, so this is a very important part of companies, organizations. Uh, they all need to secure their data and they do not want to uh, give up any of that data. This could be customer data, employee data, uh, proprietary data about how they create their products. Um, and They're typically going to be stored in a database. It's extremely important that this stays uh, within the company, so the security of the database is going to be very, very important. An architecture of a database management system uh, is provided here. Uh, so the utilities, the um, data definition language processor, the tables, the authorization tables, you see all the way down to the DBMS. So this is just an overview architecture from our textbook of a database management system. A relational database now, specifically, is a table of data consisting of rows and columns where each column holds a particular type of data, like name, which would hold a, uh, a string. Um, each row contains a specific value for each column, and ideally, uh, there's one column where all of the values are unique, and this is uh, normally referred to as a primary key. It could be more than one column that have to be uh, put together to make a primary key, but oftentimes we want it to just be uh, one column. Uh, that would make a primary key. Uh, this, with a relational database, we uh, enable the creation of multiple tables linked together by a unique identifier. That would be called a foreign key uh, into another table. And then we have a relational query language to access the database. Uh, this is normally SQL, SQL, the structured query language. Okay, from our textbook, here is uh, just an example of a relational database so that you can see all of these tables that are provided are related to each other and um, they're all related to each other by the phone number so in that primary table which is probably going to be called the phone number table or the phone table or customer table or something like that you would have the phone number most likely as a primary key and then it's going to be an, uh, a foreign key in all of the other tables so it's not going to be a unique identifier in all of the other tables. However, it's going to uniquely identify what row inside of the primary table uh, that is being referred to. The elements that we have in a relational database, um, the relation is also called a table or a file. We have tuples, which are the rows, and the attributes are the columns. Um, a primary key uniquely identifies a row consists of either one or more columns. Uh, the foreign key links one table to attributes in another, as I talked about on one of the previous slides. And a view or a virtual table is the result of a query that returns selected rows and columns from one or more tables. So we can create these virtual tables, which are like uh, tables on the fly. They don't actually exist inside of the database. Um, and these are virtual tables that are created just based on queries, and then we can query those. So with very, very large databases, um, a view or a virtual table is um, pretty common uh, to do that. It'll optimize our queries, even though we have to run two of them, it'll optimize it because we can run a view um, and then uh, run a query based on that, so it's reducing the amount of data that we have to query in our database. So here is just a little example of a relational database. Um, so you can see up here at the top we have our two tables in it. Uh, here's our primary key, the department ID. It has the department as a name and an account number. And you see that this ID here is the primary key, so it's unique. And then in the employee table we have the employee name. We have an employee ID, which is the primary key. Now each employee has a department associated with him or her. And so you notice that this is not unique. There's two 15s, which means Robin and Cody are both part of the same uh, department. Uh, their employee ID is unique, but they're both part of the same department. The department that Robin and Cody are both part of is 15, which is services. Um, and then you see a phone number for the employee. Now down here at the bottom, we have a view that was created for us that has the department name, 
followed by the employee name, ID, and phone number. So instead of giving us the department ID, which might not do us any good, uh, we actually created a view so that it returned to us instead the uh, department name instead of the department ID, which is what was provided inside the employee table. So you see the view actually is uh, kind of a merge of more than one table from our database. Uh, SQL is the structure query language. It was originally developed by IBM in the uh, mid-70s. We have entire courses uh, devoted to databases, um, so you can probably take the class in databases where you will learn this uh, in a lot more detail rather than just the overview uh, that I'm providing you here. SQL is a standardized language that's used to define, manipulate, and query data in a relational database. There are several versions of it. Unfortunately, most of the database vendors did not implement SQL specifically by the standard, so there are slight variations uh, depending on what database you're using, like if you're using Oracle compared to SQL Server compared to MySQL. Uh, the SQL is going to be slightly different for each one of those. The general idea is going to be the same. You still have create statements and select statements and delete and drop and so on. However, uh, the actual syntax, especially for more complicated queries, is going to be uh, slightly different. Now, on to the security aspect of databases. We want to uh, limit the access that uh, users have to our database. Oftentimes, these users are going to be uh, programmers uh, of different programs or the website or so on, and the database administrator needs to limit access to them because they are not the ones who are actually using the database. It's going to be users of the website that have access to it, and users of the websites may be a little more sophisticated to be able to run some potential attacks on what is being queried or submitted to the database. So we need to be careful with that. So the uh, access that's granted to different uh, users is gonna be very, very important. Um, and you can see here uh, that we can determine if the user has access to the entire database, which is portions of it, and then what rights does the user have? Create, insert, delete, update, read, write. If you give delete access to a user, you need to make sure that it's very, very secure because it's really easy to uh, pass the wrong thing into a delete statement, then you just lose your whole table. So uh, it's very, very important, uh, especially with delete operations, that you have the right uh, functionality, that the right permissions are provided. Okay. Um, uh, administrative policies, centralized administration, ownership-based administration, and decentralized administration, uh, based on who actually has the ability to uh, update the permissions or grant permissions. Uh, on the database. Two commands that you should know for managing access rights of database, grant and revoke. Obviously, you can figure out which one is used for what. Typical access rights are set on select, insert, update, delete uh, are the primary ones uh, where they are used. References refers to um, allowing uh, the user to be able to define foreign keys in another table uh, that refer to the specified columns. So, uh, those will usually be the same as if you have a uh, create permission, then you probably would also have that. Okay, inference. Now, uh, this is where we start having some uh, smarter users for determining uh, even if you have things blocked off as well as you think you can. Um, inference is the process of performing authorized queries uh, and then deducing unauthorized information from uh, the legitimate responses that are received. Um, this, uh, this problem arises when we have a number of data items that are more sensitive than, than the individual items. So when we're trying to figure out maybe aggregated data, uh, that that's really important, but the individual data is not necessarily as important. And I have an example of this uh, here on this slide. So we can see the employee table at the top and the employee table, let's say, is probably blocked from uh, our users being able to see or uh, from this specific user being able to see uh, the uh, employee table. However, there are two views that are um, provided. So based on a position, you'll have a salary associated with it. And then also based on a name, you would have uh, what department that person is part of. Uh, so those are both provided for us. Now, if uh, somebody realizes that, uh, the views are actually in the same order as the rows in the original table, then they can deduce and just kind of push those two views together and figure out that Andy is making $43,000 uh, as a salary. 
So um, it just takes a little bit of intuition there. Uh, that's why it's called inference. It's an inference example um, that you can uh, try to deduce a little bit more information uh, even though you weren't authorized to do so uh, in the first place. So how can we get around uh, inference, some countermeasures for it? Um, we can uh, think about this at database design, alter the database structure, change the access control regime. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, doing it at query time also, maybe we uh, provide the responses in different order. If it's uh, not sorted, obviously, then the user could uh, just put a sort by clause in there, and uh, that would probably uh, still be able to get around it. So you might need to have uh, detection algorithms needed, but this is obviously very difficult because it could be run at different times. It's not necessarily that both of those queries are run one right after another. So this is a difficult problem. It's still a subject of ongoing research, uh, and there are papers that are published on how we can uh, combat uh, inference attacks. Uh, perturbation is an interesting uh, um, approach also. Uh, what it does is it adds noise to statistics that are generated from the original data. So it actually modifies the data so that the statistics aren't going to change. However, the actual data that comes back uh, could be different from what's actually stored in the original table. So uh, take a look at this example here. It's kind of interesting where you can see that uh, so uh, table D here on the right. So assume if this is a query that came back and this is actual data from uh, the table. Uh, on the right here is just a modified version of it. You see that all that's been changed is the uh, males were changed to females, the females were changed to males. If you're counting how many males or females are in each field, uh, that's still going to be the same. If you're trying to figure out um, what, what the different majors are and the female to male ratio of the different majors, that's still going to be the same. Also, if you're trying to aggregate and figure out the average GPA overall, that's going to be the same. Total number is going to be the same. The only thing that's changed here is if we're trying to figure out um, uh, actually, even looking at this and figuring out uh, the average GPA of males compared to the average GPA of females, that's going to be the same just because we have two fours and two threes in each one of them. So uh, uh, just some of the data has been changed here. However, the results, if you're still trying to aggregate it, uh, is still going to be the same. So that's perturbation. That's an interesting uh, uh, approach to uh, security. One of the more common ways that we uh, deal with security in databases is through encryption. So. Um, the database is typically the most valuable information resource for any organization. Uh, just think about the university and how much data they have stored and, and if that were to get into the wrong hands or if they were to lose all of that data, what it would actually mean. Uh, this could consist of all of the classes that you've taken, the uh, number of credits that you have, the grades that you've received, your financial information, um, obviously social security numbers, bank account numbers, uh, the employee information, salaries, uh, when the payroll comes out. Um, there is so much the classes that are offered. The data is so incredibly important to any organization, not just universities, but every organization. Data uh, is the most important thing to that organization. So databases are often protected by multiple layers of securities, firewalls, authentication, operating system access control systems, database access control, database encryption. Uh, encryption is implemented with particularly sensitive data. Uh, such as passwords. Passwords often would be hashed instead of encrypted though, so that even uh, uh, database administrators would not be able to tell you what your password is. Instead, they'd be able to say, well, you can reset your password, or if you guess a password, I can tell you whether or not it matches. However, I can't actually tell you what your password is. And that's why you have password reset options on a lot of sites, uh, because they can't actually give you your password. The sites that say, here, answer a few security questions and we'll tell you what your password is, uh, you probably don't want to use a very secure password because most likely that's going to be stored in plain text inside of their database, which is how they're able to get it back out to provide it to you. Um, disadvantages to encryption, uh, key management, inflexibility, it makes it a little bit harder to work with. Um, <coughs> record searching becomes a little harder if you're dealing with um, encrypted data also. Okay, uh, so how does database encryption work? So you have a data owner. You see uh, we have a lady who is the data owner. Uh, that's the organization that produces the data to be made available uh, for controlled release. We have a user who's just a human that presents queries to the system. This goes through the query processor. It's part of the client. It's the front end that transforms user queries into queries on the encrypted data stored on the server. So it goes through the encrypt decrypt step there. Uh, we send it off to the query executor on the server, and um, the, 
the server uh, receives the encrypted data uh, back from the data owner, makes it available for distribution to the clients. The client then has to decrypt it before providing the plain text result back out to the user. So uh, there's this uh, encryption decryption step that has to take place um, for being able to send the query into the server. Uh, it's got to go in as in a decrypted state, and then when uh, the data comes back out of the database, it's going to be encrypted, and it's got to be decrypted again. So there's uh, two uh, encryption or decryptions that have to take place uh, whenever you are querying the database. Okay, the last few slides that I have for today's lecture moves on to cloud security, uh, because a lot of databases are starting to be pushed out to the cloud. And so I wanted to uh, talk about cloud services. It's, it's a hot topic right now also. Um, NIST, uh, the National Institute of Science and Technology, defines cloud computing as follows. A model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources it can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. The cloud model promotes availability and is composed of five essential characteristics, three service models, and four deployment models. Um, so this is the definition of cloud computing. Some of you may have used the cloud already. There are a few companies that are becoming very popular for cloud computing, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, possibly a few other ones. Those are two popular ones that utilize cloud computing though. So here are uh, the characteristics, the service models, and the deployment models uh, that you see. Um, the service models in the middle, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service are the three ways that companies would be able to charge you uh, for utilizing their service. So are you using it just because you want to be able to run an operating system or some software package uh, on a fast server that's located somewhere in the cloud? Or are you trying to store data uh, somewhere? And so those are the different uh, service, the SAAS, PAAS, and IAAS service models. Uh, the essential characteristics, broad network access, rapid elasticity, measured service on demand, self-service, and resource pooling. Uh, obviously, you're going to be probably utilizing computers that are much faster with a lot more resources than you have on your own computer if you're dealing with cloud computing. And then the deployment models, is it public, is it private, is it a hybrid, or is it some kind of a community model um, that we are using? This is probably where the security needs to come in the most because we want to make sure that if something is private that it does not get deployed in a different model where other people are going to have access to the data. Uh, here is the uh, cloud computing context. Uh, general ideas that we have computers that go through their own local area network, they go through a network. We have uh, the internet or maybe just some other local area network that goes through a router and that's when we finally get to our cloud computers. There are security risks with uh, cloud computing though. Here are the top cloud specific security threats, abuse and nefarious use of cloud computing, insecure interfaces and APIs, malicious insiders, uh, shared technology, da data loss or leakage, account or service hijacking, unknown risk profile. Now looking at all of these, most of these are uh, problems that we have with any kind of computing. Cloud computing might escalate these slightly because it's a little bit less in our control than storing something on our own computer or on a server that we have on our own network. However, uh, these are issues that we have uh, regardless. Now, cloud computing, again, like I said, escalated slightly because it's outside of our control that we're paying for uh, this service. So um, the threat of data compromise definitely does increase in the cloud. Um, there are risks and challenges that are unique to it and um, it does provide this unique uh, DBMS though, running on a virtual machine for each cloud subscriber. Uh, these computers, as I mentioned, are probably going to be much more powerful with a lot more resources than uh, a computer that you use or one that you have access to. And that's where the uh, major benefit of the cloud comes in, as well as backed up and uh, service agreements and so on uh, for the data that you're storing in the cloud. So that gives you an overview of database security and uh, a little bit into cloud computing, which ties into uh, data security, database security. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. Good luck.